Good afternoon and welcome to the Tall Grass Prairie and, land, and Big Rivers Landscape Conservation Cooperative Spring Webinar Series. We host this webinar series every Wednesday afternoon at 2 o'clock Eastern through the end of March. We are also open to additional presentations if you have landscape scale research or information that you'd like to share with the LCC community, uh, please let us know and we can add your presentations on in early April. So today we're going to be hearing from Abigail Derby Lewis at the Field Museum of Chicago and um, I will be speaking on uh, a landscape conservation in initiative on the Gulf Hypoxia Initiative. We'll be talking about two large scale landscape conservation designs uh, and while I'm speaking on behalf of the Tall Grass Prairie and Big Rivers LCC, both of the landscape scale designs that you'll be seeing today are uh, collaborative efforts of multiple landscape conservation cooperatives. There are seven that overlap the Mississippi River Basin and approximately five or six uh, that overlap the, the monarch migratory pathway through the mid-continent. So the first webinar that uh, I'll be giving today is in an agricultural context and then the urban monarch landscape design will be in a metropolitan context. So the Gulf Hypoxia Initiative is an effort of seven landscape conservation cooperatives that overlap the Mississippi River Basin. It is uh, coordinated by uh, Kelly Myers, the coordinator for the Eastern Tallgrass Prairie and Big Rivers Landscape Conservation Cooperative and myself, I'm Gwen White, the science coordinator for the LCC. We receive uh, tremendous spatial analyst uh, services from Michael Schwartz at the Conservation Fund and so he's been a, a primary uh, engineer of the system that I'll be showing you today. So as you know, the, the Midwest and down through the Mississippi alluvial valley is an area of high human modification. Uh, this is a working landscape and so uh, conservation efforts in this area have to be integrated into the, um, the productivity of food, fuel and fiber across the Midwest and down through the Mississippi Valley and, and really, really throughout the mid-continent. The production of food, fuel and fiber is a noisy enterprise. This map shows America's quietest places in blue and you can see that uh, the mid part of the, of the country and into the east uh, lights up and it, uh, it's, a, it's an area where there's a lot of, uh, a lot of work, uh, a lot of uh, important productivity uh, from the perspective of humans and it also has potential from the perspective of, of uh, biological and ecosystem services. There's been a lot of news lately and we know that we're losing some resiliency and productivity from natural pollinators and from uh, pest control and, and biodiversity resources across the, the nation but particularly focused in this uh, part of the mid-continent with the loss of uh, bees and other pollinators as well as grassland birds. <laughs> the um, loss of some of these species in the habitats is also related to impacts on water quality, uh, both local water quality throughout the Midwest, uh, which is being exacerbated by uh, artificial drainage and the, and the runoff, both in the surface water as well as subsurface water uh, that, that um, must be controlled uh, through that system and then also uh, concerns about both uh, drought and flooding uh, and, uh, and changes in extreme weather. This is creating local water quality concerns uh, such as the, the situation with the Des Moines uh, surface or water treatment plant all the way down to Gulf hypoxia and the loss of uh, shrimp and fisheries in an area the size of Connecticut off of uh, the coast of Louisiana, Texas, Alabama and Mississippi. Uh, this is a, a map of climate connectivity. Um, both connectivity that could be produced by, by creating corridors with or without corridors, what we see across the Midwest is it doesn't even show up on the, a national climate connectivity map. It's, uh, and, but you and I know from working in the Midwest that this doesn't tell the whole story and this isn't the legacy that uh, we want to leave in the Midwest. We have an opportunity to integrate conservation into the, the working land system by, um, by weaving prairie systems and uh, tile drainage and wetland management into the, the productive systems that we have across the Midwest. We know that the Midwest could produce 
um, some incredible migratory pathways, uh, for example, for monarch butterflies, as well as for uh, many birds that migrate from Central and South America up to the Arctic, uh, stopping uh, in stopover areas through the Midwest. So these are critical areas for biological diversity. They are also critical areas for ecosystem services, um, for the, the management of, of water and soil moisture, for uh, bird species richness and the potential for, for prairie and perennial bioenergy to provide those habitats for pollinators and uh, for prairie strips that can be integrated into the, the edges of, um, of fields and, and transportation corridors all the way down to the Mississippi Basin. So there's a lot of opportunity for conservation. The question is how would we integrate the conservation practices that we're doing and think carefully about the design of those practices as well as the location of the practices so that they do produce this multi-sector benefit for uh, the production of food, fuel, fiber, transportation, utility corridors, and biodiversity. So how do we make every dollar count that we're spending on, on uh, fish and wildlife conservation so that it does, is producing these multiple ecosystem services for multiple sectors? There are seven landscape conservation cooperatives that overlap the Mississippi Basin, and you see those uh, colors and numbers matched up with the key on the left. The, I'm speaking from the Tall Grass Prairie LCC, which is in the red there, uh, highlighted as number four across the lower Midwest. But again, all seven of these LCCs are working together to develop this landscape conservation design for the Mississippi Basin. The LCCs uh, create a forum, a think tank, if you will, for natural resource researchers and managers to come together and align their actions in conservation, engineering, transportation, public health and recreation, and uh, other social uh, products and services that we know can be provided by carefully designed and intentionally managed uh, fish and wildlife conservation. So the Mississippi Basin Gulf Hypoxia Initiative, again, is an initiative of, of seven landscape conservation uh, a, a landscape conservation design that brings together stakeholders from seven LCCs. These stakeholders met in the year 2014 at Ducks Unlimited headquarters in Memphis and developed a, a framework for uh, identifying conservation practices that have uh, potential to create, uh, to, to embed themselves uh, within this multifunctional landscape that addresses agriculture, energy, water quality locally as well as all the way down to, to the Gulf of Mexico. As you might have noticed from the introduction that we provided, uh, as, as the Eastern Tallgrass Prairie and Big Rivers Landscape Conservation Cooperative, we have a long name. So we usually just refer to ourselves as the Corn and Beans LCC. But uh, with this Gulf Hypoxia Initiative, it also gives us a new vision to refer to ourselves as the Grits and Shrimp LCC. So um, we believe that there is a, an opportunity to integrate agricultural and energy production with the, um, with the protection and, and facilitation of fish and wildlife resources that we all depend on. So which are those high conservation practices, high impact practices that uh, could have multi-sector benefits for, for fish and wildlife, water quality, agriculture, energy, transportation, utility corridors? Those um, initial practices that the stakeholders identified are listed there on the left. Uh, Basin-wide practices that could be applied uh, in, in both row crop and grazing systems across the mid-continent or um, biomass production through the use of perennial biofuels such as uh, harvest of, of prairie biomass, buffer strips, cover crops, grassland and grazing management, uh, prescribed fire, and wetlands. Within the upper Mississippi Basin and in the Midwest, Practices that uh, could be highlighted for their multi-sector benefit are drainage water management, hydrologic restoration in the uh, floodplains of the, of the main stem of the Mississippi, Ohio, and Missouri rivers, and two-stage ditches along um, smaller streams that are, are tributaries that feed into those large river systems. Similarly, down in the Mississippi Alluvial Valley, some of the practices that the stakeholders have highlighted are floodplain reforestation, vegetative diversity, and water diversion. So those are practices that uh, have the potential to be designed for these multi-sector benefits. The next question is, um, that is what we could do. The question is, where would we implement those practices so that they have 
the, the highest impact. So the first question then is where's the highest concern about nutrient loading in the Gulf hypoxia situation? And what you see on the screen is the water quality priority zone that has been kind of de defined as the, the sideboards for this project, looking at areas that produce the highest nutrient loads uh, from agriculture as identified by the USGS Sparrow model and updated for current cropland. So that's the kind of the, the defining sideboards for where there are concerns about water quality. The next step in developing this landscape design was to identify where the um, primary fish and wildlife conservation interests are as uh, revealed by regional focus areas and opportunity areas that are identified within all of the plans that we could find for uh, organizations like Audubon, the Bob White, Bob White Conservation Initiative, Ducks Unlimited, the Forest Service, Joint Ventures, um, and other partnerships. We also collected the state wildlife action plans, including the, the most recent revisions of those plans and the identification of the conservation opportunity areas uh, for the states that are listed on the lower right of the screen there. So now we know where the concern is for water quality, where there is interest in fish and wildlife conservation. The next step then is to identify where across the Mississippi Basin landscape is there receptivity to conservation action. And since we don't have a, a spatially oriented social indicator of receptivity or adoption of conservation practices, we're using the existence of watershed uh, projects as an indicator of that social capacity and interest to uh, implement conservation practices. So we collected, um, or rather Michael Schwartz from the Conservation Fund collected uh, as, as many of these data layers as we could find showing where those watershed projects are located across the Mississippi, including uh, the Mississippi River Basin Initiative, National Water Quality Initiative, the Nature Conservancy, uh, EPA Section 319 watershed projects, fish habitat partnerships, state nutrient reduction plans, and other examples of uh, watershed initi initiatives. So we stacked all of those together, and then what you see lighting up in red and orange on the screen are areas where there are multiple watershed management projects uh, as indicated by the information that we received. We want to continue to update these data layers, both for the fish and wildlife um, conservation areas as well as for the watershed projects. So if you are, are, if you are aware of other similar data layers at this landscape scale, uh, please notify us and we would be glad to work those into the system. So once we overlap the areas of water quality concern, fish and wildlife conservation interest, and uh, watershed management action, then we see where we could potentially align investment in conservation action for multi-sector, multifunctional landscapes across the Mississippi Basin. So you see those areas highlighted in red are areas where those multi-sector interests align um, and identifying where those key locations might be. So where would we start? We identified some pilot basins at the eight-digit HUC level that are um, at that intersection of water quality, wildlife, watershed projects, and um, also reflect the, the concerns identified for Gulf nutrient load. Um, there are six Midwestern watersheds that contribute over a quarter of the Gulf nutrient load, and those are listed on the screen, the Wabash, the Illinois, the Iowa, the Des Moines, the Tennessee, and the Minnesota River, as identified by uh, an analysis done by the Nature Conservancy. So on the left part of the screen there in purple, you see kind of the tier one, the highest nutrient loading potential, the greatest implementation interest is indicated by the data layers that we've identified. And then in green, some additional watersheds that would help to develop uh, that corridor throughout the Mississippi Basin. So within these pilot basins then, uh, we have the opportunity to develop a spatial analysis that shows us at the basin scale, what is the context for uh, multi-sector concerns, and then also uh, within those particular eight-digit uh, pilot watersheds, the Conservation Fund uh, developed a 30-meter scale local planning tool that you see on the bottom right there that gives us uh, more refined information about where the wetlands, the prairies, the floodplain forest um, systems could uh, be implemented to contribute to these larger uh, multi a multi-sector Mississippi Basin scale um, conservation issues. 
So I'm going to show you a couple of examples of uh, different organizations that are using these data layers in conservation planning efforts at different scales. The first is a county planning application. Decatur County, Indiana is located in kind of south uh, central Indiana. They were doing a comprehensive plan revision and uh, there were some concerns about the location of uh, confined animal feeding operations, livestock, uh, livestock operations, and the application, land application of manure from those operations. So the um, county planner was asking the question, where in the county are there areas where we have uh, higher, higher value for conservation and water quality protection and those areas could be zoned then uh, so that the working land uses would be positioned in other parts of the county that are uh, perhaps less sensitive uh, to water quality and, and uh, wildlife habitat concerns. So these are the data layers for grassland, forest, and wetland potential that uh, came from the system. And the, uh, the county planner that was working on this project said the, the value of using this system uh, is that it not only reflects local uh, concerns and interest in conservation, but it also allows them at the, at the county level and the county com with the county commissioners to position these, uh, this conservation zoning design into the larger, uh, a larger scale um, initiative for Gulf hypoxia and, and wildlife conservation across the whole Mississippi Basin. So similarly, a group of stakeholders, including soil and water conservation districts, the DNRs of Indiana and Illinois, Ducks Unlimited, the um, Fish Habitat Partnerships, and the Nature Conservancy, and the Potoka River National Wildlife Refuge are working together to use these data layers and build from them uh, a, a conservation planning tool for the area of the Lower Wabash River, which extends along the border of uh, South southern Illinois and Indiana from Terre Haute down to the confluence with the Ohio River. So as you can see, the goals uh, of this local stakeholder group do reflect those larger Mississippi Basin concerns about wildlife and nutrient management, um, soil health and water quality, but they also have identified some more local concerns about connection to nature and concerns about ad adaptation to future changes, including the, the increasing flooding along uh, this, the floodplains of this large river system and the potential impacts on uh, agriculture, particularly for corn and soybeans, but also the opportunities that that might lead to for enhancing conservation in those areas that are uh, no longer as amenable to uh, row crop production. So the data layers, uh, they're using these data layers to try to identify uh, some of those local conservation areas in the lower Wab Wabash floodplains. At uh, the level of, of southern Indiana then, Sycamore Land Trust is also using the data layers to identify wetland corridors uh, for land trust uh, acquisition and conservation easements. And um, they have identified these corridors not only because they provide good wetland habitat, but also because they contribute to these larger scale concerns. A statewide planning application is an example of the Indiana DNR corridors uh, project, which is uh, kind of builds out of their state wildlife action plan effort in conjunction with uh, NRCS pollinators and EQIP uh, farm bill program targeting uh, types of activities, as well as the Indiana Department of Transportation looking for uh, opportunities for habitat along toll roads, interstates, and state roads, utility rights of way, and then the National Bob White Quail Initiative. So again, this gives them the opportunity to identify their priorities at the state level, but also to uh, lay those in to the context of the whole Mississippi Basin, and then also use the smaller targeting tool, the more refined targeting tool at the 30 meter level to identify where there are opportunities within these state priority areas for uh, wildlife conservation. A more recent, in fact, uh, this is a product that just came out uh, this week as a draft, and the final product will be available in the summer, this summer. The Upper Mississippi River and Great Lakes Joint Venture used uh, some of the data layers from the uh, Mississippi Basin Gulf Hypoxia Initiative to identify areas of where there are key concerns for waterfowl habitat, but also in areas where that habitat and those wetlands can also provide some uh, contribution for water quality management uh, within the Gulf Hypoxia Initiative. So they've identified 
areas that you see on the screen within the upper Midwest Great Lakes LTC across the, the northern part of the Midwest and then the Tallgrass Prairie LTC across the south, uh, where there are where there is an intersection of biological and social concerns um, for for stakeholders. Looking at kind of the whole Midwest area, then the um, Upper Midwest Great Lakes LCC and the Tallgrass Prairie LCC are are uh, co-coordinating, co-hosting an effort that's bringing together state wildlife action plan managers. Um, initially, starting with Wisconsin, Michigan, Illinois, and Indiana to identify where there are common interests in conservation across uh, across those states, and then also the potential for expanding that across the, the entire Midwest, perhaps uh, looking at the, the Midwest Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies uh, as a set of states where uh, these interests could be expanded for regional conservation planning. So the themes that they've identified are pollinators, large grassland complexes, and freshwater mussels. So what's next for the multi-LCC Gulf Hypoxia Initiative? The, the um, conservation blueprint itself is, is available as kind of a, a, an early generation version uh, that, as you've seen, has been used at different scales to do uh, conservation planning in different, in different types of situations. We'll continue to update those data layers and, and integrate those spatial analyses with additional models and tools uh, as models for water quality and models for social, ad, social uh, receptivity or adoption of conservation practices continue to be developed. We'll continue to, to um, improve and refine this conservation planning tool. The practice fact sheets that describe the list currently of a dozen high impact conservation practices. We'll continue to refine those, expanding information on cost effectiveness of those systems uh, where we can find research or um, support research that quantifies the, the impacts of those conservation practices. We'll continue to, to integrate that into these fact sheets which are all available online and then also associate those practices with the spatial analysis so that we're um, more clearly identifying which practices are, um, have the most potential in which locations across the Mississippi Basin. We'll also be preparing case studies. Uh, as I've shown you a couple of uh, situations where the tool is being used, but we'll, we'll um, further define and explain those in a series of fact sheets so that you can see how others are using these tools and have some ideas about how they might inform your programs as well. We'll be talking, we'll be working on messaging and audiences, and in particular, uh, as there has been a significant amount of research that's come out of the Midwest recently uh, on the human dimensions uh, that are, that is driving the adoption of conservation practices, um, we'll be working to synthesize that information and use it to guide outreach and extension, um, particularly for the conservation practices that we're highlighting in the, in the locations across the Mississippi Basin. And then finally, so that we can track the, the change and impact of, of conservation and, and land use across the Mississippi Basin, we'll be developing a set of metrics that are kind of a, a short list of shared measures across different conservation programs that could be used as a, a set of leading indicators for landscape, landscape change uh, within an agricultural uh, conservation context. So what could you do with these tools? Uh, please feel free to explore the tools. They're all available uh, at no cost online. All you have to do is register on uh, databasein to, to use the viewer for the data layers that I've uh, shown you. There are over 200 data layers uh, in the system. So if you're looking for state wildlife action plan opportunity areas for a particular uh, state within this region or Audubon uh, priority bird areas or other similar types of data layers, uh, please feel free to come to, to this system first and save yourself a little time in looking for those data layers um, and, and access them here. If you have any questions about the application of this tool to your to um, targeting conservation investment in your program, uh, please feel free to contact us. And if you're using the tool, uh, that's, that's really wonderful. Uh, please let us know so that we can know how to, how to continue to refine these um, so that we can connect people to nature on the rich soils of a functional working landscape. So visit us at tallgrassprairielcc.org to learn more about the tools and their development and feel free to, to provide us with suggestions about refining this tool. 
So, so thank you, and I probably have time, uh, I believe, for a couple of questions if anybody wants to unmute the phone and, and uh, ask questions. And again, I would remind you that this webinar is being recorded, so um, please unmute yourself, ask the question, and then, and then uh, shift back to muting your phone. So thank you very much. Yeah, hey, Gwen, this is Ted LaGrange. So. Hey, uh, the, the database and management tool, um, that's, do we get to that on the, the LCC website? There, there is a link to it from the LCC website. So if you go uh, to the website and look for the um, Mississippi Basin Initiative uh, portion of the website, then uh, kind of go through that to the where, where is this being, where, where are these practices implemented, and that will give you the links. But you can also just contact me directly, and I'd be happy to send a, um, a two-page flyer that has the links listed on it. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Question for uh, Gwen? Yes. Hi, this is Anthony Sasson, and I was uh, looking at your list of, of uh, BMPs early in the, it's about slide eight or ten or somewhere back there, and uh, I didn't see nutrient management listed. Uh, maybe that, there's a reason for that, uh, but I didn't see it there. So. Is the nutrient management, fertilizer management on the crop fields included in the in the BMP list, and something that's being emphasized also? Yes, um, we definitely recognize nutrient management um, practices as a as a key aspect of protecting, particularly uh, fish and wild, fish, fisheries habitat, aquatic habitat. The the twelve practices that um, that the Working team selected were practices that that are um, emerging practices that have uh, the highest potential for for uh, both fish and wildlife producing both fish and wildlife habitat directly as well as for um, providing filtration for water quality and and other ecosystem services. So um, the the team kind of identified that that shorter list. That's not to say that other practices like nutrient management. Um, aren't important and don't have, or, or integrated pest management uh, clearly have uh, a function within this system. Well, thank you for your interest, and uh, if you have any other questions, please feel free to, to contact uh, us directly at the LCC, and I'm going to turn it over to Abby to um, set up the, the webinar for the urban conservation landscape design. Thanks, Gwen. Next, we have Abigail Derby Lewis and Alexis Winter with the Field Museum. Um, Abigail and Alexis, if you're ready, you can go ahead and start. Sure, yeah, thanks very much. And just to say um, to Gwen that that was an excellent presentation and um, we really enjoyed it here. So, what we thought we would do is give a, a presentation that we recently put together. Uh, my colleagues Craig Zarnecki and Lex Winter and I, for the North American Wildlife and Natural Resource Conference. And we were invited to that conference specifically to be a part of a symposium on making relevance a reality. And they wanted us to talk about the connection between nature and culture and being able to increase conservation relevancy by using the urban monarch work that we have been uh, developing over the last year and a half um, as a case study. And so this particular presentation is really going to focus more on the social science components of the work that we did, in part because I think it's often left out, particularly on the front end of many of the conservation efforts that, that we do. And so this is really meant to focus a little bit more on that piece and to also offer some insights into what that study was about, where we are in it, and what that is shaping up to be. So this effort in particular, I should say, is one that was identified and funded by U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and it's a strategy for supporting monarchs in urban landscapes. And the way the project was developed and the methods used to implement it are really central to this question of how do we make conservation relevant. Relevancy, as we know, is about making connections to what people care about, what we value, and what influences our quality of life. And studies have shown that communities favor initiatives 
that lead to stronger neighborhoods with increased walkability, access to food, access to green space, a greater sense of place, development of mixed land uses, and closer neighbor and family ties. And acknowledging and incorporating community values into conservation outreach is key to successful engagement. So to answer the question of relevancy, we should probably take a step back and actually start with a different question, which is how do we build strong, just, sustainable, and resilient communities? because the pathways to helping people work towards these and other community values can absolutely overlap with conservation actions. And sometimes we can even think of conservation as the co-benefit of pursuing these other goals rather than the primary goal itself. And what's more, any conservation program that's too narrowly focused and fails to take into account the full context of the socio-ecosystem will ultimately only be a Band-Aid, treating the symptoms, so to speak. So making these connections will need to start with a deeper understanding of what communities really do care about and what they're already doing that aligns with conservation goals and how we can support and build upon and expand these actions. And community-based conservation is an approach that seeks to meet conservation goals through encouraging local stewardship and integrating social and environmental priorities. And it aims to better recognize local people's knowledge, interests, values, and roles and rights in natural resource management. And the movement itself emerged in the 1980s as a response to what's called exclusion conservation and top-down management. And a very distinct feature of it is that it's an asset-based approach. This means that instead of approaching a community with a deficit perspective of what they don't have or what behavior should change, it looks at the assets, including their natural, social, and human-built capital, and seeks to connect conservation actions to these assets, their cultural values, and the concerns expressed by community members. And it's important to note that assets include knowledge. We recognize that many forms of knowledge and wisdom, there are many forms of those, and that often science and traditional knowledge are saying the same things in different words. And we recognize that we have much to learn from the communities with whom we work. This is the approach that the Field Museum has had success with for over two decades, both in the rural Andes Amazon landscape of South America and in the urban landscapes of the Chicago region. And this, too, is the approach that we used in the Monarchs View of the City project, which developed a conservation design for monarchs in urban areas. And the effort kicked off about a year and a half ago, and it was piloted in four major metropolitan areas along the Monarch Central Flyway, including Minneapolis, Chicago, Kansas City, and Austin. And the Field Museum's interdisciplinary team of anthropologists, ecologists, geospatial analysts led the effort to develop a strategic plan for the urban monarch conservation. And the project itself is rooted in a very important contemporary question, which is, does nature need cities? We know that cities need nature. This is very well established. But it's not as obvious as to whether nature, and in this case, monarchs, really need cities. The idea that the urban landscape actually matters for species is not yet a mainstream conversation that's happening. It is, however, certainly one that's beginning to take hold. The project is really the beginning of how to answer that overarching question of what contribution can cities make to the monarch butterfly. And to address this, we assess both the ecological and the social influences on the urban landscape as they relate to monarchs. And we use this information to develop a suite of tools aimed at decision makers to help them identify where are the best places and what are the best ways to create monarch habitat in cities. A tool that touches on the social dimension is the Urban Conservation Guidebook. Um, this is really intended as a how-to for strategic urban monarch conservation, and it calls out best practices for engaging a diverse set of stakeholders. And from the ecological perspective, it's a template for creating a geospatial model. And this model really helps to assess and prioritize opportunities for creating that habitat at a local scale. We are in the very final phase of completion of these tools. And in fact, um, we're set to launch them in the next couple of weeks. What I'll focus a little bit more on, as I mentioned before, are some of these best practices. Um, we're not going to go too in-depth into a walkthrough of the geospatial model, um, but that's something that we'd very, very much like to do um, maybe at the next opportunity. 
And I think this dovetails really well with the U.S. national effort on monarch conservation, which identifies an all-hands-on-deck approach needed for monarch conservation. And this does include the urban piece. But I think that urban piece is a little harder to wrap our minds around exactly what that looks like. And in part, it's because traditionally we use national scale data, right? So we use that 30 meter resolution data to look at urban areas. And when we apply this national scale to an urban area like downtown Chicago, so you see the Field Museum there, all we see is red indicating development. And this makes it look, look as if there are zero opportunities on the ground for habitat. But for those of us who live here, who work here, who play here, we know that this is not the case. And in fact, when we apply a much higher resolution, one that actually goes down to the sub-meter level and can identify and pick out the grass shrub layer, we see a wildly different landscape, one that is extremely relevant to monarchs and other pollinators and to birds. And all of those green spaces that you see there represent opportunities for monarch habitat at different scales and various land uses. These are things like our city parks and our gardens, our churchyards and schoolyards, our corporate campuses and cultural institutions, our residential spaces, and even our rights of way along transportation corridors. And taken together, collectively, these opportunities can play a very important part in monarch conservation. What I'll do now, actually, is slide the phone over to my colleague, Lex Winter. She is the head social scientist on this project here at the museum. And I'm going to let her talk a little bit more about our thinking that went into the social component of urban monarch conservation. Hi, everyone. So the image that you have in front of you is what we call our urban monarch butterfly, butterfly supply chain. And why, the reason we created this was at the beginning of the research, we wanted a way to step back and look at the full context of the range of actors who might be involved and might be relevant to monarch conservation in cities. So um, what we have going on here is people doing on the ground work is one part of it, but there's so much that contributes to that. And you see we have flows of information and materials, which is mediated by groups and individuals that make these monarch conservation actions possible. So these flows and exchanges are shaped by these individuals and groups' cultural values, perceptions, and beliefs that bring people to their participation in networks. So people's values, perceptions, and beliefs motivate them to act on behalf of the monarch or not act. People, as you can see, must also have power to um, take action on behalf of the monarch. So they may want to do but um, not have the decision-making power to do that. So if monarch conservation needs to be sort of all hands on deck, requiring a variety of approaches and actors to sustain the species, then seeing the social world of monarch conservation as a system like this really brings our attention to what all hands means in this context. And we also look at it this way to see what are different points along these flows of this process where we might do research and what are different points where we might intervene. So if there's a gap in the flow of information or the flow of materials, that may be something where we can um, create a tool that helps people take steps to fix that gap. So this, again, is returning to land use. Um, we really want to make sure that the social component and the geospatial component of the project speak to each other and complement each other. Um, when we look at potential plantable space by land use type um, to assess where the greatest opportunities exist for putting monarch habitat in the Chicago region, we see that residential stands out. Not on this chart um, is agricultural land, and that's about three times uh, the amount that residential is. But that's also very quickly converting um, over to residential. So residential is a really huge opportunity both now and will be more so in the future. This kind of lens can be helpful for conservation organizations and city departments to help think through where the biggest opportunities are and identify networks already working with the various stakeholder groups that are relevant to these land use types. Um, but to successfully engage different land users in monarch work, we need to dig a little bit deeper. 
So um, to begin to get a better feel for how different assets and stakeholder groups shape the urban monarch system, we studied the social world of monarch conservation, looking at what motivates people to take action on behalf of the monarch, what challenges they face, and what strategy, strategies are most effective. We conducted interviews um, in person and on the phone, and also set up an online survey to get a, a really wide um, participation to try and answer some of these questions. And we targeted both people who we um, know are working on behalf of the monarch and would describe it that way. You know, I'm, I have a monarch conservation project. We also um, try to include people who are doing things that maybe are more indirectly relevant to monarch conservation, but they wouldn't necessarily describe themselves as working on behalf of the monarch. So that's, that is those um, green boxes you see there. This is the structure of both the um, survey and the interview guide that we used. So first we asked, are you doing something that's, um, that you would consider monarch conservation? And if they said yes, they answered a bunch of questions about that. Um, but they might have said no. And then they were asked, are you managing a piece of land? You have a garden. Um, if they said no to that, then they'd go uh, to, you know, are you someone who is a vendor or designing landscapes and so on. So we got at all these things that um, are relevant but maybe not necessarily directly monarch work. Um, part of the, uh, the guidebook does include the text of these, uh, the interview guide and the survey, so what's nice about it is that you can sort of break off one piece of this that you see here, like one of those boxes, and just do a survey focused on that if you know that um, that's something that's going on in your locality and you really want to dig deep on, on just that one. So we got... Um, roughly 800 survey responses and did uh, 100 interviews across the four cities where we conducted the study. And this information was used to inform best practices and engagement insights um, that you see are broken out by land use types. So again, we're, we're seeing that certain things um, apply across all land use types, but we're also trying to focus on how do they differ by land use type so that, again, we can be syncing this up with the geospatial component. So the darker shading indicates um, that the finding on the left applies more strongly in, the land use con in that land use context, while lighter shading indicates that the finding applies but may not be as uh, prevalent or widespread in that land use type, or it wasn't something that really um, rose to the top in our research. We also call out various co-benefits of uh, monarch conservation. Again, uh, Abigail mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we're you know, very focused on co-benefits of conservation. Um, so those are highlighted in blue, as you can see in the chart. Um, and these are points where conservation goals intersect with community values and interests, and, and also other um, conservation goals, such as you see, like uh, conserving water. Um, it, we definitely saw, heard a lot about um, stormwater management. So these uh, best practices and engagement insights can be used as a starting point to assess which strategies may be most effective with working with these dif different stakeholders who own or manage different land use types. So for example, if um, as, as we saw in our context, if you have identified that residential land is a high opportunity area for you, um, a variety of best practices and insights surfaced, including the use of demonstration gardens, one-on-one uh, -on -one in-person communication and providing habitat options that include more traditional garden designs, such as planting native flowers in clumps instead of a prairie-style layout and incorporating them with a mix of non-native nectar sources that communities may be more familiar with. So we saw this by you know, interviewing gardener, gardeners who were really active in their neighborhood and seeing how they use their garden to kind of teach their neighbors about monarch conservation and what designs they used um, have these gardens be more acceptable in their neighborhood based on sort of people's aesthetic um, and cultural conventions and ideas about what a garden should look like. So I'm going to turn it back over to Abigail. So back to that beginning question of do monarchs need cities? We'll end with this image here. I think it's a pretty compelling image myself. It's the I-35 corridor that stretches from Texas up to Canada. And this narrow stretch occupies 167 million acres of land, land that correlates with remnant habitats in the monarch migratory pathway. And nearly half of it occurs within a metro county, which is a county with a central city of over 50,000. 
And to put this into the context of the monarch work, the estimates for the total number of milkweed stems currently on the ground in a place like Chicago, or the region of Chicago, which is a seven county area covering six million acres, is estimated at 16.7 million stems. That is a previously underestimated asset we can definitely build on. And if we could imagine something similar for the I-35 corridor metro counties, we'd be looking at something in the ballpark of 200 million milkweed stems as the baseline. Now take that possibility and scale it out to all of those other black clusters that we see that are also urban areas scattered about the landscape that monarchs use, and we cannot ignore the importance of cities, not just at engaging millions of people. More than 80% of the U.S. population lives in urban areas and over 50% of the world's population does as well. So it is clearly an important area to be engaging and connecting to people. But it also has the potential to put functional habitat on the ground in areas that have agricultural deserts, that have suffered major habitat loss. They can be these migratory pathways or components of those pathways that Gwen spoke about. So if you haven't, if you haven't guessed the answer to the question from our perspective, um, it's yes. Our answer is yes. Monarchs really do need cities, and conservation organizations need to be able to connect in cities too. Monarchs in many ways are the ideal species to engage the public on conservation because they are so captivating and charismatic, and they're a powerful symbol culturally. And they can get many people on board and talking to each other about conservation who wouldn't normally be doing so. We talk about monarchs being a convener, connecting people from Mexico to Canada who are all witnessing this amazing migratory pathway right in their very own backyards. And we're beginning to discover just how monarchs are relevant to a diverse set of stakeholders and strategic approaches that can be used to scale up the creation of monarch habitat in urban areas. And this work, I think, can be very helpful in thinking through, as conservation communities, what are those pathways that we can identify to make conservation relevant to a broader and a more diverse population. So I'll stop there, and we're happy to answer um, any questions that folks may have. Well, everyone's thinking of their, their deeply rich questions. I just wanted to make sure that I went to the acknowledgement slide as well. So there were many, many people who were a part of this project and wanted to acknowledge um, you know, our team partners, our project partners, and um, to make sure everyone knew that this was you know, a, a multi-scaled effort and had many people involved from the beginning. In fact, Gwen uh, White was one of the people, if not the person, who originated um, this idea. And I um, want to make sure that, that folks know how many, how many people are being brought together to really think through this in a, in a thoughtful and meaningful way. And it, uh, thank you, Abby and Abigail, for a, a beautiful presentation with a lot of wonderful implications for, for urban uh, residents and conservationists. And I just wanted to point out for the person who asked earlier about uh, links for the Gulf Hypoxia data layers and viewer, I put those in the chat box. So um, please feel free to open that chat box and, and take a look at or copy out the, the links for access to that uh, system of the Gulf Hypoxia Precision Conservation Blueprint. And if anyone has any questions for, for either of the presentations, uh, please let us know. Okay, well, thank you so much, um, Abigail, Alexis, and Gwen, for y'all's presentations today. All of the contact information for all presentations are on our website, tallgrassprayltc.org. Um, please feel free to go to that website to get any of the resources that we've discussed today. Um, next week, 29 March at 2 p.m. Eastern Time is our last scheduled webinar. Uh, we have Mark Hurst joining us from Kansas State University. He'll be telling us about his study assessing how landscape factors affect Henslow Sparrow habitat selection. This presentation touches on the importance of heterogeneity in vegetation structure and landowner programs for the Henslow Sparrow and for other imperiled grassland species. If anyone listening would like to talk about their work in the Eastern Tall Grass Landscape or any other LCC projects going on, please send 
me, Abby Donnelly, an email. Um, my uh, contact information is also on the website. Um, I'd love to work it out with you to keep this webinar series going. Uh, thank you so much for joining, and we hope to see everyone next week.